Father, we come before you and inevitably before uh, this day is through, we will go back on the, the declaration we just made. Inevitably, we will decide that, that we have accomplished something, that we have done something, that, that we are more than just the tools that you use to accomplish your will. We will think that we have arrived, that, that, we, have, that we are something special. But Father, remind us that apart from the saving uh, grace of Jesus Christ, that, that, that we have no claim to make before your throne. There is nothing in our lives that is good, that is good enough, that is, that is even good at all, that we could call good, to stand before you and proclaim them on our own. And so, Father, remind us of who we are and who we are in Christ. Yes, we bear your image because you gave it to us. Yes, we are covered by the blood of Jesus because he died for us. There is nothing of us, of our works, in, in what we proclaim before you. Instead, help us to have the mindset that says that we stand on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as our salvation. And then help us to live with that humility. That we didn't deserve it, and we didn't earn it, and we can't. And so when we stand before you, when we take your message to the world, when we indeed just, just live our daily lives, we do so at the pleasure of our Father. We do so because of his grace because of his mercy. Remind us of that today. Father, I pray that you would be with Thomas as he speaks. I pray that you would bless his preparation. Bless us as we hear. Teach us now. We beg it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys for singing with us. I appreciate it very much. We're looking at an, unimpor an unimportant church in an insignificant city. I'm going to say it again because y'all missed it. An unimportant church in an insignificant city. All right? Today's sermon is the beginning of a verse-by-verse verse exegesis of Paul's epistle to the believers in ancient city of Colossae. Got that one? That's not a Parkinson's word, but I almost say it anyway. Colossae. Sounds official, right? A verse-by-verse verse exegesis. That means we're going to study the book of Colossians, Okay. This particular New Testament letter has a special place in my heart because it's written, if you missed it, to an unimportant church in an insignificant city. The famous theologian J.B. Lightfoot, y'all don't know him. Me and J.B. go way back, right? <laughs> J.B. said, I call him J.B. for short because we're, we're buds like that, even though he's been probably dead as long as I've been alive. But anyway, Famous theologian J.B. Lightfoot, he once said, this is his quote, he says, Colossae, talking about the book of Colossians, Colossae is the least important church to which any epistle of St. Paul was addressed. So in Paul's day, Colossae was in the region of Phrygia, and it was part of the Roman province of Asia. The population was diverse. It was, it was majority Jewish, or majority Gentile, and had a large Jewish population as well, but very diverse, okay? And in the centuries prior to Christ, Colossae was like a center that was, a, was, was very important in the trade route. It had a thriving textile industry. It, it had made a certain kind of, of wool that was very popular. In fact, a high-quality red wool was known as Colossian. It's kind of like Corinthian leather today, right? It was Colossian wool, very, very high-end stuff, very prominent city. These are the centuries leading up to the time of Christ. However, womp, 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 by the time Paul writes his letter, He's in house arrest in Rome. It's like 60 to 62 A.D. And the neighboring cities of Laodicea and Hierapolis, they had surpassed Colossae in prominence. They had become where people wanted to go, right? So the ancient city of Colossae today has been in ruins for centuries. Absolute ruins. And just because it's so unimportant and so insignificant, those ruins that are in plain sight, you can get on the internet right now and pick them up, and you can just, just see in Google Images all the ruins of Colossae. They have never for centuries and centuries been excavated. Right? So an insignificant city. And then inside this insignificant city in first century uh, uh, Rome was an unimportant church. The church in Colossae was not founded by Paul. In fact, not only was it not founded by Paul, Paul never even visited the church, never even been there before. Where is Colossae? He couldn't find it on a map, right? It says in Colossians 2.1, <clears throat> For I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, 
for those in Laodicea, see that he mentioned the other city and what he's talking to them, right? Because they're unimportant. And then he says, for all who have not seen me in person. So these people in Colossae, these believers in Colossae, they had never seen an apostle. They had never seen specifically the apostle Paul. He had never been in the city. Instead, the founder of the local church in Colossae was probably a man named Epaphras. We're going to call him Epi for short because it, it makes my, my tongue hurt to say Epaphras 55 times. But Epaphras was probably the founder. We know that from Colossians uh, 1, 5b through 8. It says, you have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Well, how did the gospel come to Colossae? It's bearing fruit. And it's growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. All right, this is an awesome gospel. How did this little insignificant city hear about it? You heard this gospel. You heard this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the spirit. So here's how it works. Stop me if this sounds familiar. Stop me if this sounds like maybe this is how it should be. You ready? A guy named Paul believes in Jesus Christ. And then he's, he's dedicated wholly unto Jesus Christ. And he gets this, I don't know, maybe we'll call it a commission. He believes in Jesus, and he becomes dedicated to Jesus, and he gets this commission from Jesus to go tell people about Jesus. Right? So then Paul is in Ephesus on his third missionary journey, and he talks to a guy named Epaphras, okay? Epi for short. That's his new nickname, Epi, right? He talks to Epi. And when he talks to Epi, he does something crazy. He shares the gospel. And then Epi does something miraculous. Epi believes that gospel. And then lives change, and miracles happen, and somebody gets, what's the word? Saved. And then that actually, truly, following after Jesus, saved person, can't be the same as he was. He can't do what he used to do. He's not following the same path. He's not prioritizing the same things. And then he goes back home and does the most crazy thing I've ever heard. He tells somebody else that same gospel that he believed in, and then other people get, what's the word again? Saved. And when they get saved, they're like, you know what? I'm saved and you're saved and we're saved. We're all saved. You know what we should do? We should hang out in a brown church across from a, a strip mall that has an Ollie's in it maybe, right? And we'll just park on the side over there. We'll hang out together because we all kind of believe the same thing, right? And then a church is born, right? Epaphras was a Gentile from Colossae. And apparently after he got saved, he went home. When he got home, he preached the gospel. And after he preached the gospel, he planted a church. An unimportant church in an insignificant city. Now, according to Paul, Epi was many things. Epi was many things. He was never Epi, by the way. I named him Epi, all right? Epi was a dearly loved fellow servant. Right? That's important. That's coming from an apostle. He said it, right? He was also a servant of Christ. He was a faithful minister of Christ. Paul's words. He was Paul's fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. He went to jail for the cause of the gospel, right? But there's one profound, astounding, irrefutable fact about little Epi. Epi was not an apostle. He was not an apostle with a big A. That means he saw Jesus, got his commission from Jesus, and told people about Jesus firsthand. He wasn't an apostle with a little a. He wasn't a follower of the other apostles, right? He was just a Christian. So let's do a little summary here, just in case you missed it. I'm speaking slow, but you might have missed it. You ready? You ready for it? Here we go. The apostle Paul wrote this New Testament letter, wait for it, to a church plant. To a church plant. It was founded... By a regular Christian. Regular Christian. Right? And the church and the city and the founder, they're never even mentioned by the, the Apostle Luke in, in the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles, right? That the, the, 
the start of the New Testament church, beginning in Jerusalem and going across the Roman Empire. Luke was so precise. He compiled so much information. He was, he was such a scholar, such a historian. You know what he never mentioned? Epiphras. You know what he never mentioned? Colossae. Because as far as Colossae was concerned, I mean, Colossae was a city that was just not impressive to anybody in the Roman Empire. Right? In the opinion of many people. And when I say many people, I'm talking about people back then, first century Rome. I'm talking about people in the past, I don't know, 50 years that write commentaries and say how unimpressive Colossae is. Right? In the opinion of many people, both then and now, this was truly an unimportant church and an insignificant city. And again, I ask, does that sound or feel familiar? <laughs> an unimportant church and an insignificant city, right? But in the mind of the Apostle Paul and in the opinion of God the Holy Spirit, the members of this ancient local church, they were very important. And therefore, they were worthy of receiving the revelation of God. Think about it. An apostle that had never been there to this city that was not of note anywhere anymore, had its day in the past, and now it was nothing. A group of believers that had never even seen an apostle before, they received Scripture, the revelation of God Almighty. Everybody that had a letter of Scripture written to them this week, raise your hand. They received Scripture, right? The inhabitants of this ancient city, in the, in the mind of the Apostle Paul and in the opinion of the Holy Spirit, the inhabitants of that city, the lost folks, they were very significant. didn't matter what their city was. They were very significant. And they needed to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So with all of this in mind, as we study the beginning verses of Paul's letter to the Colossians, we're going to learn... I'm only going to learn one of these today. We're going to learn six realities that characterize the local church. Six realities that characterize the local church. We're going to spend the next mm, couple Sundays in Colossians 1, 1 through 2. So let me read that focal passage for you. While you're listening to it, see if you can find them. Six realities that characterize the local church. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So let's talk Greco-Roman letters in ancient times. You ready? It had an opening. It had a body. That's the stuff I'm telling you about. And then it had a see you later. Opening, body, closing, right? <coughs> the opening of a Greco letter usually had a prescript and a thanksgiving. It had a prescript. That's how they got started. And then it had a Thanksgiving, right? Our focal passage tonight and next Sunday is the prescript, okay? And it contains a salutation. Hey, y'all, how you doing, right? And then a greeting. Hope it's all going well. And this is the typical pattern found at the beginning of all of Paul's 13 letters, right? Opening, body, closing. Prescript, Thanksgiving, okay, over and over and over again. So let's talk about this salutation. First, we're going to see the author of the letter. Unlike our letters, we sign our letters at the end, right? Not, not so in a Greco-Roman letter in the first century. They signed in the beginning. They wanted you to know this is who this is coming from. First thing's out of his mouth. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will, and Timothy, our brother. <coughs> So he starts off with the Greek word polis. Now, this was probably the name that the Jew Saul was known by among Greek and Latin speakers. When he's around the Gentiles, he was Paul. When he was around the Jews, he was his birth name, Saul. Saul was born and raised in a town called Tarsus in Sicily. If I can say it right, Cilicia, excuse me. He was a Hebrew. Right. And his ancestry was very important. It could trace back all the way to the tribe of Benjamin. Saul's family, because of where he was born and where they were, were Roman citizens. So by age 13, Saul gets sent away from Tarsus and he goes to Judea to learn from one of the prominent rabbis in the area, Gamaliel. OK, 
Saul when, went on to become a lawyer. That means he's an expert in the law of Moses. He's a lawyer. But he was also a Pharisee. That means he was in one of the, the, the ruling parties of the area, right? And all signs pointed to upward mobility, right? Paul's changing lives and making miracles happen. He's impressing all the right people. And one day, he's probably going to be a member of the Sanhedrin. That's the ruling body of the Jews. Because of all this, Saul was extremely zealous for Judaism. Zealous for Judaism. And he considered Christianity to be a cult. He considered it to be a heretical perversion of Judaism. So very soon thereafter, he became a leading persecutor of the church. Saul of Tarsus begins persecuting the church. Acts 8, verse 3. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. <clears throat> he would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. Paul is serious. He's not playing around. You know why he's putting them in prison? So they can be executed. Doesn't appreciate Christianity. It's a cult. It's a perversion. It's heresy. Right? But one day, on his way to, I don't know, persecute some Christians, right? On his way to Damascus, Saul has a face-to-face -face encounter with somebody that he can't ignore. We're going to call him the risen Jesus Christ, okay? And then, at that moment, Saul, who was the persecutor of the followers of Christ, Paul becomes, Saul becomes Paul, an apostle of Christ. Saul, the persecutor, becomes Paul, the apostle. A 180-degree turn, right? In this salutation of his letter, he refers to himself in a very particular, specific way. Listen to what he says. He says, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. Now, when he calls himself an apostle, it's the word apostolos in Greek. That Greek word had a, a wide range of meanings, okay? It could mean messenger. It could mean ambassador, representative, missionary. But here's the basic concept. It started with, with maritime words um, centuries before Paul. But what it meant was a person sent on a mission. I'm a representative of somebody else. I've been sent on a mission. I'm carrying a message. Okay? So here in this passage, the word is being used in the official sense. Okay? He is not just an apostle. He's not just one sent on a mission. He is one sent on a mission by Christ Jesus. Right? Paul is an official representative of Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. And he was sent by Jesus to deliver the gospel message. Okay? But he wasn't just an apostle of Christ Jesus. He also did things by God's will. He became this apostle by God's will. In other words, he wants his people that he's writing to to understand right off the bat, humanity had nothing to do with me becoming an apostle. Humans had nothing to do with Paul's calling at all. Paul did not choose it himself. It was chosen for him. It was given to him. It was bestowed on him, right? Men did not appoint him to this office. They didn't have an election. He didn't run for office and smear his, uh, you know, his, his opponents in little, little attack ads on television and, and send texts to Thomas over and over and over again about voting in a certain way and then get appointed to this apostleship, right? Men had nothing to do with it. It was because of the will of God. The murderer Saul became the apostle Paul because of the will of God. All right, so here's the point. Paul is establishing in this letter right off the jump. He's establishing his authority to give direction, right? He's going to give them direction. He's going to give them correction. He's going to give them encouragement. He's going to direct their path. He's establishing his authority to do that. He's saying, by the way, this is why I'm worth listening to, right? His authority over this Christian church in Colossae was based on the will of Jesus and on the commission of Jesus. Now, of course, as always, the Smarties debate, right? There's always a debate. There is a debate over who wrote this letter, believe it or not. There is a debate over who wrote this letter. But I'm going to say it this way. If you want, if you want to see me after, after church, I can show you the 17 pages of research I have and everybody running around in circles to come to this conclusion. You ready? Church tradition, that's the people closest to the original letter. Guess what they thought? They thought Paul wrote it, right? 
I don't know if you were looking at verse 1 with me, but the letter itself kind of says Paul wrote it, right? And then little old me, he's going to add myself to the pile, right? I think Paul was actually the author. Go figure, okay? This letter, I believe, is part of a group of letters that are commonly referred to as the prison epistles, okay? The prison epistles. Kind of like a prison concert by Johnny Cash, right? It's the prison epistle. It is written in a prison. Paul is awaiting trial. He's in Rome. He's under house arrest. He has a guard. He's allowed a secretary. He's allowed correspondence. And he goes, you know what? Got some time to kill. Got my little ankle bracelet on, sitting in the recliner waiting on my trial. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write some letters. And he writes Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, and a little old book called Colossians, right? All written by Paul while he's under house arrest in Rome. But it also says in our passage today, and Timothy, our brother. He says, from Paul, an apostle, and from Timothy, our brother. The word Timothy right here, his name literally means, from the Greek, it means honoring God, okay? Timothy became Paul's ministry associate at the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. Okay, and over time, Timothy became many things. He became a powerful evangelist. He's leading people to Christ, right? He became Paul's spiritual son. They became tight. And then he became the pastor of the church in Ephesus. He even had some scripture twice written to him. Okay, so Timothy's not a he's not a, a little deal by any stretch. Now, again, some smarties. Because they're debating the whole Paul authorship thing, right? They go, well, you know, Timothy, I mean, it says it right there. It's from Paul. And there's Timothy, this brother in Christ. Timothy's responsible for the material. Paul's just a figure. He's just standing there. He just looks over to them and goes, yeah, uh, Timothy, you said some good stuff. Go ahead and send that. I'll I'll stamp my name on it, right? Or at worst case scenario, he's he's like a co-author. He's helping, you know, Paul's getting up in age. Paul's having problems. He's got like an eye disease going on. He's been beat up a couple times, shipwrecked and left outside for dead and stoned and all that. You know, Paul's not in his right. He's got a little PTSD. He's got a little concussive brain syndrome going on, right? Timothy's just going to hold his hand. Kind of like, you know, kind of like the the latter years of Ronald Reagan. You know, he don't really know where he's at. I'm just going to pat his hand. That was too political. Anyway, (laughs) my point is this. All that is not what happened, Okay. Given, <laughs> I couldn't do I couldn't do the modern uh, example of that because that would be way too political, right? But anyway, all right. Given his close relationship with Paul, it seems to little old me more likely that he is serving as Paul's secretary. Okay, he has a spiritual mentor. This mentor is writing to churches. This mentor can't see good because he's got an eye disease, right? So you know what he's going to do? He's in prison with him anyway. Might as well help a brother out, right? I might as well just write something down for you, okay? So he's serving as his secretary while he writes his letter. And Paul, because he's got good home training, he's got good manners, he's going, hey, y'all, it's Paul. By the way, Timothy's right here. Timothy says, hey, too. Everybody with me so far? All right. That's the author. Who are the recipients of this letter? Colossians 1, 2, the the first part says, To the saints in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters. Now, as I stated before, the people around them considered this church in Colossae, this fellowship, to be unimportant and insignificant. And maybe this church in Colossae was filled with super Christians, right? I mean, maybe, maybe they just rolled right off their back. They just walked outside, and everybody just looked at them like they weren't anything. And they invited people to church, and nobody came. And, you know, people came to church, and they were unimpressed. And maybe they were just super Christians, and it just rolled right off their back. Nobody, nothing sticks to me. I'm just loving Jesus all the time, right? But more likely than not, they considered themselves unimportant and insignificant because that's how the world treated them. That's how they were treating each other. Might as well view myself that way, right? And again, I ask, very uh, on, the, on, on the nose, remind you of anybody? Right? But when Paul addresses them in this salutation, he does the unthinkable. He speaks to these, these insignificant, unimportant believers. He speaks to them as if they're chosen by God. Like God chose those people. 
God loved them enough to send his son to die for those people. He treated them and spoke to them and addressed them and gave them scripture as if they were, I don't know, valuable. He treated them and spoke to them and loved them as if they and he together were the bride of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? And in a beautiful, poetic, simplistic, divinely inspired way, Paul is teaching you and I, in these two little verses, six realities that characterize the local church. Don't panic. We're only going to do one today. Just one. Five more are coming. Maybe the next Sunday, maybe Sunday after that. Three Sundays later at the most, right? But we're having five more on the way, all right? Six realities that characterize the local church. Reality number one, this one is low fruit, people. Put your ladders away. In fact, sit down. You can reach this one right like this. You ready? Right off the tree. The members of a local church are saved. The members of a local church of Jesus Christ are saved. Where do you get that from, Thomas? He says, to the saints in Christ at Colossae. These saints are in Colossae, but more importantly than being in Colossae, they are in Christ. You ready? The theologian John R. W. Stott, I don't call him J.B. J.B., we are on a first name basis, but I give John all the letters and all the initials, right? John R. W. Stott, very famous theologian, by the way. He has quoted this, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read his quote outright because I, I tried to Thomasize this thing like six times, and, and, and he said it better than me, so I'm just going to read what he said. You ready? He said, the commonest description in the scriptures of a follower of Jesus is that he or she is a person in Christ. The expressions in Christ, in the Lord, and in him, they occur 164 times in the letters of Paul alone. 13 letters. Some people argue 14, but 13 letters, right? And 164 times, some version of in Christ occurs and are indispensable to an understanding of the New Testament. To be in Christ does not mean to be inside of Christ as tools are in a box or as our clothes in a closet, but to be organically united to Christ as a limb is in the body or a branch is in a tree. It is this personal relationship with Christ that is the distinctive mark of his authentic followers. The word Christian, this is what he says, this is the, this is the big conclusion, you ready? The word Christian occurs only three times in the Bible. Because of its common misuse, we could profitably dispense with it. Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul never used the word, or at least not in the recorded teaching. What distinguishes, listen to this last part, it's very important. What distinguishes the true followers of Jesus is neither their creed, nor their code of ethics, nor their ceremonies, nor their culture, but Christ. What is often mistakenly called Christianity is in essence neither a religion nor a system, but a person, Jesus of Nazareth. See why I had to quote him? That's tight right there. He thought that through. He prayed that one through, right? Paul is saying that the recipients of his letter are in Christ. He says they're in Christ. I'm writing to you people, and you people are in Christ. This expression is referring to being saved. Specifically to be in Christ, it alludes to being baptized by the Holy Spirit when you place faith in Jesus Christ. Being baptized by the Holy Spirit when you place faith in Jesus Christ. When you place faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit plunges you, baptizes you, dunks you into Jesus. And now you identify with him completely. Now you are united. There's a union there. There's an identification there. What happens to him happens to you. What happens to you happens to him. You are one. Look at Romans 6, verse 3 through 7. Romans 6, 3 through 7. Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. For if we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died, listen to these words, since a person who has died is freed from sin's claim. So look at verse 3 of that passage that I just read. He says, Paul also writing to the church in Rome, he says, Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He says, baptized into Christ Jesus. The word there is baptizo, and it means to immerse. It means to plunge. Sometimes it was used of drowning somebody. Sometimes it was used of sinking a ship. You get the point? You're all the way in there. There's not, this, this ain't a toe at the edge of the pool. This is all the way in. You are immersed. Okay? So here in Romans 6.3, believers are referred to as people who were plunged into Jesus. 100 64 times in the Bible. Just the letters of Paul. In Christ, in Christ, in him, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ. Plunged. We have been plunged into Jesus. Right? At that moment that a person turns away from sin and self and places faith in Jesus as their Savior, they are spiritually plunged. They are spiritually baptized into Jesus Christ. And that means they completely identify with him. And they are completely united with him. They completely identify with Jesus. They completely are united with Jesus. Now we're going to have a sermon within a sermon. Okay? The baptism that is spoken of in Romans 6, it is not the ordinance of believer's baptism. That's not us going to Lake Murray to my favorite little little cove over there and walking down the hill and standing on the, on the drop where the sandbar ends in the water, trying not to fall backwards, right? And being baptized out there in a little white robe. It's not talking about believer's baptism. This is not water baptism, right? Romans 6 that we just read is talking about the spiritual baptism of salvation. How you and your Savior at the moment of faith become one. Okay? Become united. When we are baptized into Christ, we identify with him in three major ways. When you place faith in Jesus... And the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. You identify with him in three major ways. To be baptized into Christ, number one, is to identify with his death on the cross. Paul says you were baptized into his death. To be baptized into Christ is to be baptized into his death. Look at Galatians 2, 19 through 20. For through the law I have died to the law so that I might live for God, Paul says. Listen to what he says. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That means when we place faith in Jesus Christ, we are plunged into his death on the cross. He died on the cross. When we're plunged into him by faith, we died on the cross with him. And that means the wages of our sin are taken care of. Remember, we say it every week, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is hell, the second death, right? We don't have to worry about the second death of hell. We don't have to worry about uh, death everlasting, right? Because when Christ died and we placed faith in him, we now died with him. And that means the requirements of the law, which say I have to die, the requirements of the law have been fulfilled we are now dead to the bondage of sin and we are dead to the eternal punishment that we deserve the wages of sin is death a death was paid we identify with that death so quite literally the debt of sin in our lives as sinners as people who have rebelled against god it has been paid because we are in christ and in christ we have already died you understand We don't have to die forevermore because in Christ we already did. Then look at verse 4. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. We were buried. Very strange, right? New Testament says this all the time. We were buried with him by baptism into death. 
Number two, to be baptized into Christ is to identify with his burial. First, I identify with his death, then I identify with his burial. And that makes me ask a question because I'm a thoughtful person. I'm trying to figure this out. I see this all the time over and over in Scripture. Jesus was, he was crucified and he was buried. He died and he was buried. He died. Why, why are they, why? you know, that makes no sense, right? Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. And then he was buried. Hmm. And then he rose again on the third day according to Scripture. Why? Over and over and over and over again. He's buried. He's buried. He's buried. Right? Why does Scripture emphasize this burial of Jesus all the time? I'll tell you why. Because burial certifies the reality of complete death. What do you not do? You don't bury people that are alive. No human race, no, no, no group of people, no ethnicity has ever made a habit of intentionally burying people that are still alive, right? Well, you're going to die, die eventually. We're just going to go ahead and bury you now. See what I'm saying? We bury people that are dead. You don't bury people who are near death. You don't bury people who have fainted. You don't bury people who are just, well, he's just unconscious. I mean, I can see him breathing, though, right? You bury somebody who is completely dead. So Scripture emphasizes the fact that Jesus was buried because that burial certifies that he truly sacrificed his life on our behalf. He can't pay the debt of my sin, which is death, if he didn't actually completely die, right? The fact that he was buried certifies that he was dead. So for the believer, being plunged into Jesus' death means that our union with Christ is absolute and complete. Absolute and complete. There is literally no turning back. We are completely and totally one with him. And we have completely died to sin. We have died to self. We have died to Satan, right? And those things are no longer our false gods. Instead, Jesus is now our Lord and, and our Savior, right? He's our Lord and our Master. Number three. To be baptized into Christ is to identify with his resurrection, identify with his death, identify with the certification of his death, his burial, and then I identify with his resurrection. Okay? It says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. The big news, the big news flash, the reason you're here today is because Christ did this crazy thing. He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. It says he was raised from the dead. How? By the glory of the Father. And just as we were plunged into his death, and just as we were plunged into his burial, when we place faith in Jesus Christ, we were plunged into his resurrection, his resurrected life, all when we place faith in him. We have completely identified with his death, burial, and resurrection when we place faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay? That's what it means to be in Jesus. Now back to our actual passage, Colossians 1, 2. In verse 2, Paul refers to the local church in Colossae as the saints in Christ at Colossae. What he is saying is that these Colossians who assemble together, these Colossians who worship together, they fellowship together. He's saying all these people are in Christ. That means they are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. There is an irrefutable reality that characterizes the true, genuine local church. You ready for it? Money back guarantee. This will always happen. If it's real, the members are saved. Characterizes the local church. And then I'm going to add an addendum to that. At least they profess to be saved. We don't have a, a read your heart right? We're not God. But the members of a church, they're, they're saved. They at least profess to be saved, right? Now I'll read to you Article 2, Section 2 of the Bylaws of all this, the Beacon Church, Church, Church. Right? You ready? Any persons who have personally received Jesus Christ as their Savior and are committed to Him as Lord, who have received baptism by immersion as a testimony of their salvation, and who desire to be committed to the Beacon Church as, as a local body of believers, they may become members of the Beacon Church. Would you like me to summarize that in not legal terms? Would you, would you like me to summarize that? Before you can join, join our, our, our vast uh, sundry of, of, of members, as far as the eye can see, right? Before you can join that, you have to openly profess to be saved by grace 
through faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, you have to believe that you're saved. You have to believe it. I can't tell you you're saved. I can't wish you were saved. I can't remember a day when I thought you were saved. You have to come to me and go, you know, I'm saved. I believe this thing called the gospel. And then you have to declare it. You have to like say it out like you can't just believe I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe it over here and say I'm saved. You have to declare it out loud. You got to tell somebody about it, right? I don't know. You have to walk through the waters of baptism. It's like a public thing. It's like a big deal. Like I'm showing everybody I'm, I'm doing this dramatic presentation of, of how I was baptized into Christ when I get baptized in water, right? So you have to believe it yourself. You have to declare that you're saved. And then in order to join Beacon Church, you have to commit to be part of a group of saved people. You have to believe you're saved. You have to declare you're saved. And you, have to do, you will have to commit to a group of people who are saved. Which leads us to ask the question, Thomas, why? Why is that a big deal? Why can't I believe in some other God and be part of the Beacon Church, right? Because the Beacon Church treats members differently than it treats visitors and attenders. Every church should. We treat members differently than we treat visitors and attenders. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to break it down for you. Saved people are expected to serve actively. If you're visiting or attending our church every now and then, or if you haven't decided yet, or you haven't joined, or you're looking around, it would be silly for us to go, you know what? You came twice. I need you to come clean the bathroom with me. <laughs> right? You don't, you don't do that. We treat members differently than attenders and visitors, right? Members are saved. And saved people, I expect you to serve actively. Saved people are expected to give sacrificially. We don't pass a plate at the Beacon Church. Primarily, not for y'all's benefit, yes, okay? But primarily for the benefit of somebody who's visiting. Or someone who comes in, or someone who's making a decision, or whatever, because I don't want them to have a lasting image in their head. The Beacon Church looks like this. Thomas looks like this. He only preached on tithing like six times last week. Like he, he this is Thomas, right? Say people are just expected to give sacrificially. We don't have to beat that to death, right? Say people are expected to not forsake the assembly. I'm not going to call somebody up who's not a member of this church and go, "Yeah, I didn't see you last week." I we'll need you to write 500 times a piece of paper. I will not skip church. I will not skip church. <laughs> you don't do that, right? But say, people, you expect them to come to church because they're supposed to be here. It's supposed to be an encouragement for one another. They're supposed to be serving God, right? Say, people are expected to encourage one another in the faith. Sometimes someone's going to come through the doors here, and they're, gonna, they're not going to be very encouraging. They're going to be argumentative maybe, whatever, and we give them grace for that. You better give them grace for that, by the way. You're going to give them grace for that, right? And the reason for that is because saved people are expected to encourage one another, not, not the person who we don't know. We don't know what they are, right? Saved people are expected to study the Word of God. Saved people are expected to study the Word of God. I expect you guys to know what's going on. When I say we're in Colossians, I expect you to know where that's at, right? Saved people are expected to hold each other accountable. Somebody who's visiting or attending or trying to make their mind up, I'm not going to walk through the room. You know what? I, I had some things. God's put it on my heart that you're a sinner. Let's talk about the things that I need to hold you accountable for today. You're not going to do that. But brothers and sisters in Christ who have signed on the line, brothers and sisters in Christ who are committed to each other, who have become part of this family, I expect you to hold each other accountable. You should expect to hold each other accountable, right? Say people in this sermon today, We'll get a different message. Every Sunday, think about it. The church gets a message that comes out of the Bible. And then just in case, somebody who's visiting, somebody who's watching online, somebody who walks through the door at the last minute, just in case, or one of you who thinks they're saved and they're not, just in case, the non-saved person or the person that we don't know their salvation yet, they get a whole different sermon. Sounds like the gospel, right? Sermon to the church. Gospel is someone who's not part of the church yet. See what I'm saying? God holds saved people to a higher standard. Say that again because y'all missed it. God holds saved people to a higher standard. So if we are truly saved, if we truly follow this Jesus Christ, if we are holy and dedicated unto him, then we should hold ourselves to a higher standard. Right? Application number two. 
Maybe you're a member of the Beacon Church. And you feel like this fellowship, this one right here, the Beacon Church, you're 18. Maybe you feel like this fellowship is unimportant and insignificant. Don't look at me like I'm, I'm, I'm an alien. Hey, Krista, how's things going to church this week? Oh, well, you know, we all right. Have a lot of people come? Yeah, well, we had a couple people. What are you doing? Happens to me all the time. You get reserved. You get quiet. Why? I don't want everybody to know that we have less than 30 people in a little strip mall right across from Ollie's. So I'm ashamed. I feel unimportant. I feel insignificant. I've been made to feel that way. You tell everybody, how many people are in your church? About, about, about 27 on like a, like a heavy day, like when everybody's in town and nobody is sick and everything's fired on all cylinders, right? And they go, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Give you that little southern smile. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> My father on a regular basis referred to this as, well, how's your little church doing? You know? If you're not careful, you'll let people make you feel unimportant. Like your church is insignificant, right? Or let's take it one step further because that's, that's not personal. Let's, let's get in your face day today, all right? How about you personally? Let, let's, let's get off of the Beacon Church. Let's talk about everybody in here today, everybody individually sitting here right now. Have you ever been made to feel unimportant or insignificant in your walk in Christ? I'm not good enough, not strong enough, not spiritual enough, not whatever enough. Not dedicated enough, not faithful enough. Don't use the, the Ricky Righteous or the Susie Spiritual jargon when I talk every week. I don't pray the right way. I don't speak the right way. I don't look the right way. I didn't dress right today, right? Well, if you've ever felt like this fellowship is unimportant and insignificant, or if you've ever felt personally to be unimportant and insignificant, let me encourage you because I drew encouragement for the past, I don't know, two, three months now studying the book of Colossians. There is absolutely, positively, nothing more important and significant and precious to our Lord and Savior than saved people. And this is a collection of saved people. Nothing more important, nothing more significant, nothing more precious to God than the people of God. How, how do I get to that? Romans 8, 38 through 39. Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. On a personal level, personal, our importance and our significance and our value and our worth, they are not found in our job. They are not found in what the world says. They are not found in our accomplishments. They're not found in pictures of fish. They're not found in anything that I do or say that impresses somebody. My value, my worth, my importance, my significance, your value, your worth, your importance, your significance is found in Christ. That's where we find it. Saved people are valuable in the heart of Almighty God. Because we're in Christ. He's my value. He's my worth. He's my strength. He's my accomplishment. He's the goal. He accomplishes all through him, by him, for him. I was created through him, by him, for him. I was recreated in Christ. And as for this little, unaffiliated, underfunded, under-resourced, Storefront Church, we are a valid, faithful, local expression of the universal church of Jesus Christ. Don't you ever let somebody make you feel small. Don't you ever let someone make you feel insignificant, unimportant, unimpressive. Don't ever let that happen again. Satan and the seed of Satan will do that every time. But this church is every bit the body of Christ. This church is every bit the bride of Christ. We are the family of Almighty God. Every bit, every one of us, our value is in Christ. And he thinks we're more. He sees 
the struggle. He knows when we're tired. He knows when we hurt. He knows when it doesn't get fixed. He knows when it's never going to get better. He sees the tears. He sees the struggles. He sees when people hurt us. He sees when our feelings are crushed. He sees when we're not motivated anymore. He sees it. And Scripture says he is moved with compassion. Internal turmoil at the sight of those who are heavy burdened and weary. That's us in the eyes of Almighty God. That is a Savior who loved the unimportant and the insignificant so much that he went to a cross and died so that we would no longer be part of Satan, no longer be united with Satan, no longer be headed for an eternity in hell, but so that in him, in Christ, we could have everlasting life. He thinks we are more than conquerors. He thinks we are more than important. He thinks we are more than significant. And it is long past time that we started to agree with him about this church, about our Christian lives, about ourselves as individuals. We are not unimportant. We are not insignificant. We're the bride. We're the body. We are the household. Of Almighty God. A collection of precious things set apart and dedicated to the God of all creation. Remember that when you go home today. So how do I become saved? How do I become part of this this organism that is the, the family of God? How do I do that? Well, first you have to realize that all have sinned. And all fall short of the glory of God. Step number one to being saved. Step number one to being in Christ. Step number one to being united with the one that made you. Fulfilling the purpose of the one that made you. Step number one is realizing that you fall short of that purpose. You fall short of that glory. Step number one. Realizing that I have sinned and I fall short of the standard set for me by God Almighty. And then I have to accept something. I have to accept that because I'm a sinner, because I fall short, because I rebel the plan of Almighty God, I deserve to die. The wages of my sin is death. There's a place called hell that is the second death. I deserve these things. I have earned these things. That's what I have merited. I have to understand after after I accept that the wages of my sin is death, I have to understand that I can't solve my sin problem. I can't solve my death problem. I can't solve my eternity problem. Not on my own. There's no righteousness I can do. There's no act I can do. There's no good that can, over, that can offset the bad some sort of way. There is no, listen to my words, please. There is no such thing as a good person. One is good per Jesus, God. There are none good. No one righteous, no, not one. No one who seeks after God, no, not one. Instead of me doing it on my own, instead of me earning heaven on my own, instead of me earning the presence of God on my own, I have to understand with all that I am that I need to be saved. I somehow need to be in Christ. I somehow need to be united with him. I need his help, his salvation, his rescue, his redemption. I need him. We are saved from the consequences of death and hell. We are saved by grace, an undeserved, unmerited gift. We are saved by grace through faith. Faith is how I receive that gift. It's not of myself. It's not by works. It's God's gift. And I'll never be able to boast about what I did to have a home in heaven. Once I understand that I need help, I have to understand that I receive the the gracious salvation of God, faith in Jesus Christ. How am I in Jesus? How do I get in Christ? How do I become one with him? How do I identify with him? I accept the gracious gift of Christ through faith in him. Faith in God's word is belief in action. I believe 
what the Bible says about who Jesus is. I believe by what the Bible says about what he did for me. I believe those things and it changes me. It transforms me. I literally am plunged into Jesus and I identify with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. First and foremost, I believe that God loved me so much he sent his son to die in my place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, they will not perish. But what? They'll have everlasting life. I have to believe that with all my heart. And then I have to believe the unthinkable. It's one that irritates people sometimes, but the truth does that, right? I have to believe the unthinkable. That Jesus, he's not a way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. His words, listen to his words, the words of Jesus Christ. John 14, 6. I am, he says, the way, the truth, and the life. And then he tags it. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words. Jesus is the exclusive way to heaven. Elsewhere, it says, there's no other name under heaven for which a man can be saved. Only Jesus Christ. I have to believe in the only way to heaven. Once I believe that, then I have to believe the how of salvation. The how of salvation is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The how of salvation is Christ died for my sins, according to scriptures. I owed the wage of death. He died for my sin. And then he was buried, certifying that my debt was paid, certifying that my account was cleared. And he died for my sins according to Scripture. He was buried, and then he did the unthinkable. He rose again on the third day according to Scripture. He is alive, proving himself to be God, proving himself to be a worthy object of my faith. And because he has proven himself, I have to believe one more thing. I have to believe that this guy that died, he's not just a man. He's not just a somebody. He's not a liar and he's not a lunatic. He's my Lord. What he said, I can believe. He said he would die and rise, and he did. He said that he would die at the hands of his own people, and he did. He said he would rise, and he did. He said he'll come again and receive me unto himself, and he will. Because he was, and he is, and he always will be God the Son. I have to believe it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word, that's the title for the Messiah, the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. Crucial part. Can't just believe it in my head. Can't just be something that, well, that sounds nice. Nice story. Can't just believe it. It has to be a matter of my heart. And that requires repentance. I have to turn away from my sin and myself and my concepts, and I turn towards Jesus Christ. I can't be in Jesus Christ if I don't turn away from me and turn towards Jesus Christ. I have to confess with my mouth that he's my Lord. I have to believe in my heart that the Father raised him from the dead. And the promise of all scripture is if I do that, I will be saved. So my question for you before we close, before we pray and before we sing a song, my question is simply this. Are you in Christ? Do you have an intimate, personal relationship with the God of all creation? That's question number one. If you don't, you can pray this prayer with me right now. Father in heaven, I'm a sinner. I deserve to die. I deserve to spend eternity separated from you. I know it to be true. There's nothing I can do to fix it. But I can surrender. I believe that you died in my place. You expressed love of God. I believe you're the only salvation that there is. The only way to heaven. I believe with all my heart that you died and were buried and rose again on the third day. And you proved yourself to be God Almighty. So I want to turn away from me. I don't want me anymore. I surrender. I quit. I quit trying to do it on my own. And I turn towards you and let you do the work. The only one who can do the work. I confess with my mouth that you're my Lord. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. Save me. Save me. And if you prayed that prayer, follow it up with this. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a home in your heaven. And then if you're here today and you feel like your church is insignificant and unimportant, if you're here today and you feel like your life is insignificant and unimportant, if you're here today and you struggle with depression, if you're here today and you struggle with meaning, if you're here today and you struggle with valuing who you are, let's pray this prayer together because we've all been there before. Father in heaven, why do we allow this lost and dying world to dictate who we are? Why do we allow this lost and dying world to tell us what our value is? To tell us what our morals are? To tell us what our identity is? 
Our identity is bound up, Heavenly Father, in two words. In Christ. We are in Christ. That means we are empowered by Christ. We are indwelled by Christ. We have united with Christ. We identify with Christ. We are in union with Christ. We are the bride of Christ. He is our groom. We are his body. He is our head. What can be said about the mighty people of God? We're in Christ. Let that be our value. Let that be our worth. Let that be our self-esteem. We beg it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah.